Well, hello again, and welcome to another episode of the Hyperion Adventures Podcast. I'm Tom. As always, I'm with my gorgeous, super smart, best <laughs> researcher in the world, time travel loving <laughs> wife and co-host Michelle. Thank you. Hi, everybody. What is that about? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so good to have you with us for whatever this episode is going to be. We is are it recording a it. Superb time travel. Ooh, that would be a lot of fun. Maybe yeah. we need to break into one of those sometime. Ooh. Yeah, jot by, that down. By the way, we had a family member dress up as uh, Perry the Platypus for Halloween yesterday. By the way, uh, very hope you had a very happy yes. Halloween and safe Halloween. We did have a family member dress up as Perry the Platypus. Perry the Platypus. Which uh, is very fitting for our family, <laughs> I will yes. have to say. Um, but all the kids looked fantastic, so mm. that's kind of cool. So uh, we are recording this episode on Sunday, November 1st, 2020. We've gotten through the Halloween season. Like I wow. said, we hope you had a very safe and fun Halloween as much as it could be for this year. Everything's kind of different but different experience yeah but hopefully you had a great time and it was safe and you enjoyed it as best you could we're into november yes we're into the holiday season <laughs> so let's get those christmas trees up and those christmas <laughs> lights up because it's november 1st after all that's right? right that's right no haste no haste no haste we got some brand new christmas lights that i'll be hanging Yay. up uh, sometime in the next week or two for sure for our house we're excited about that thank you for joining us today in the future you can find us most everywhere you get podcasts over the very best place to find us is on our own website hyperionadventurespodcast.com and while you're there <laughs> oh you can sign up for the newsletter <laughs> love the dramatic pause <laughs> And you we'll be back with that up. right after the break. You should sign up, right? <laughs> yeah. You should sign up for the newsletter. It's awesome. It is. Well, I'd like to think it's awesome. <laughs> it's something. <laughs> uh, but it's just a way to kind of stay more in touch with the Hyperion Adventures podcast world. We put lots of information out there about what's going on, uh, past episodes, current episodes, upcoming episodes. Um, we ask for questions. You know, input from you first mm -hmm. out there. Um, the Hyperion Adventures Disney Hall of Fame, which we announced a new category, a new classic category for this last week. Disney Dishes Blog Recipe of the Week, which, by the way, I think I actually screwed up the link this week and left the link up for the, the oh, previous no. week's one. So no. I will be also putting up the link that was supposed to be <laughs> on this week's uh, newsletter. I didn't. I thought about just sending it out a second one with the link, and I'm like, I already promised I will not clog your <laughs> inbox. So we'll just wait another week. So the link for that the pumpkin chili uh, mm. will be in uh, this week's. So if you didn't find it already, I mean, the link takes you to the website. You probably could have found right. it, but just to make it easier for you, we will include that along with another uh, recipe for this week in right. the newsletter. And sometimes we put in little tidbits of mm -hmm. news that we might not share on the actual podcast. Right. And uh, yeah, Michelle will sometimes give me something. She's like, oh, we're going <laughs> to give this as bonus material for those who sign up for the newsletter. So um, every once in a while we have something like that. And we have a couple other things coming out that if you're a subscriber to the newsletter, you will be the first to find out about. Now, I did mention we do have a new Hyperion Adventures Disney Hall of Fame category for you. So we've announced it on for those of you on the newsletter. Now we're going to announce it out here for everybody who listens to the podcast. By the way, before I get to that, our second month in a row where we broke download our records, our single month you, download everybody. record. Thank you so you're the very best, much. Yeah, people, uh, we appreciate so much that you're um, coming and enjoying this podcast. And we're getting new listeners all the time, and you're telling your friends, and, and we really appreciate it so much that you've chosen to make this part of your Disney, you know, fun, your Disney interaction week, and we are completely honored by it. Thank you. Yeah, definitely honored, and can't believe it. And thank you again, uh, as you said, and we certainly appreciate the feedback. We've gotten some really 
interesting feedback at times and things that um, have really helped, I think, us um, make it a better podcast for everybody. Yeah, that's all we want to do is make it the best podcast we can that you enjoy listening to week in and week out. Of course, not every topic is going to hit everybody that we do, but right. we want to try and make it as as entertaining as possible. So we hope you're enjoying it. And please hit us up and let us know uh, if you're enjoying it or what topics you'd like us to hit because we will always want the input. And we'll, I'll be passing out all the information on where you can find us in just a second as we do every week as you know <laughs> uh so we do have a new category for the hyperion adventures disney hall of fame again it's a classic category one we had last year as well it's best animated character mm. so we did have several uh animated characters make it in last year mostly because we went ahead and grandfathered in the entire sensational six yeah, mickey true. minnie right. donald daisy Goofy and Pluto uh, also got w the characters that were voted in by you uh, for our ballot last year. They made it into our inaugural Hall of Fame class were Genie from Aladdin mm -hmm. and Woody from Toy Story. So all those characters are already in our Disney Hall of Fame. Uh, you don't need to worry about voting for them this year. However, we would like some nominations for uh, this current one. Just give us your five favorite, five-ish favorite <laughs> uh, and uh, the ones that get the most uh, nominations will make it onto our final ballot at the end of the year. Right. We're getting closer and closer to uh, wrapping this up. Yeah, we only have, after this category, we only have one more category left, and then wow. we start doing our actual ballot. And we will have, for when you vote on the final ballot, if you want to enter into a giveaway, we will have a prize package that will go there. I don't know if some of the stuff that we discovered yesterday was going to go on there, but we had an amazing <laughs> excursion over the last two days into our garage to <laughs> <laughs> kind of tidy up the garage. Uh, most of what was in the garage is actually garbage. <laughs> but we did find some stuff. Well, there were some boxes that we haven't opened since we moved into this house. Right. What's it been? Almost It's been over 13 years wow, now that we've yeah. been in this house uh, that we have not opened up. And Michelle has some amazing <laughs> Disney artifacts. I started collecting quite young. Yeah. Uh, just fantastic stuff. We, we sat half the time out there just going through it and looking at, wow, look at this and look at that. What was yeah. the favorite thing you think you found yes or a couple of favorite things you Ooh, found yesterday you've forgotten that you had well i think one of my favorites that i i had that we ran across was the commemorative um pass into um euro disney when it the year it opened before it became it, yeah, disneyland a, paris right yeah. it's a giant uh ticket and that was uh something that i purchased that i remember like wow that's so cool um and let's see, for other items, finding uh, the stockholders or shareholders meeting signed autographed by Michael Eisner. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. When you showed that to me, I was like, wow. <laughs> That's pretty Great, awesome. To Michelle. So, I don't think either of those things will be in our gift basket, no. but there may be some artifacts that we found in there that, you know, we're like, okay, we yeah. can kind of add this in and kind of spice it up a little bit, but we'll have a lot of fun stuff in the, the gift basket for that end of the year final uh, ballot. Now let's uh, move on and we uh, want to connect with you also on social media. So please, if you want to interact with us as far as voting in for our Hyperion Adventures Disney Hall of Fame, if you want to just comment, whatever, on our, you know, or suggest topics, please hit us up on social media. We're very active on social media. We're on Twitter at Hyperion Podcast, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Hyperion Adventures Podcast. We do have a YouTube channel. Hopefully you're watching some of these episodes that we put out on YouTube. Maybe sometime. Now, I know Frank and Jen from Dillo's Diz Theme Park Thursday have been doing a What's in the Attic, kind of what they found in their parents' attic that are all Disney cool. uh, historics. Right. Maybe we'll go down and take the camera down and look at some of the stuff that we've had true. and do a What's in the Garage uh, from true. us and kind of <laughs> climb on to what they're doing because we got a lot of cool stuff out there. So please uh, check us out on YouTube. If you want to find us, just do a search for Hyperion Adventures Podcast. Hit subscribe and you'll already you'll know exactly when we have a brand new video out there. Speaking of that, we had somebody who watched our video from last week, did not get a chance to chime in on their five favorite not so scary Disney moments. So they wanted to chime in this week. And this sure. is from uh, Jacqueline from P uh, Pixie Dust PhD. She has her own great YouTube mm -hmm. channel. Uh, she said, uh, this was such a fun topic. Here are some of my not so scaries. Five, that feeling when it's a minute or two before your fast pass booking window opens up. <laughs> ha ha. Right. Right. Yeah, that's especially scary, Jacqueline, especially here on the West Coast when we always have to, can we get up at 4 a.m. Right. to make those fast pass <laughs> plus minutes? Uh, she went on to say, 
for number four, everything about the Winnie the Pooh Halloween, right? which was one of Michelle's favorites. Uh, number three, the anticipation of the track switch at the top of the broken rail at Ex- Expedition Everest. Ooh. That can be, uh, yeah, yes. that's, you know, I, I think Michelle, I'm surprised almost that you didn't have the anticipation uh, sitting there at. Um, uh, the rock and roller coaster right. because I know that beginning of that will, yes, will it gets you true. very scared that every time. <laughs> it's that kind of that same anticipation there that it's like it's scarier than the entire ride right. put together. So uh, number two, the moment in Toy Story three when the gang is in the incinerator. Yeah, right. I think we all went through it. Uh, the first time we watched that, a terrifying right. moment there exactly. for sure. And uh, number one was everything about Chernabog, uh, which is from, of course, Fantasia. Mm-hmm. So uh, very cool. She said, super fun show. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah. We really appreciate your input. Right. And uh, you can still chime in. If you have not so scary moments, we'll still be happy to add them in future episodes. Hit us up uh, through our social media or through our Gmail account, Hyperion Adventures Podcast at gmail.com. Right. We love hearing from people that way. We do yeah. hear love hearing from people that way. And we also also love hearing from people who give us reviews. Reviews help us many ways uh, mm-hmm. to f- have other people find us. They're looking for Disney podcasts. There's an algorithm out there. You get more reviews. You get more ratings. And that helps people find you. And we did get a brand new five-star Ooh, review this week. That's yay. exciting. Yeah. So this came in. I have listened to quite a few Disney podcasts. While I enjoy many, there are a fairly small number I listen to every week. This is one of them. Aww. The show is fun, entertaining, and genuine. Keep up the great work. That is Troy from Disney Assembled, who has his own wow. podcast. Thank you, Troy. That yes. is very kind of so you. Touching. And we're so happy that uh, you've enjoyed uh, what we are putting out there week in and week out. Yes. Thank you so much. That We're really honored to receive that and any of the reviews that mm-hmm. we've received so far. But thank you. That's really so sweet. And, you know, we really do try to share what, You know, we think people will like what we like and we love the positivity that we get back. It's just phenomenal to me how how great of a community this is. Yeah, it's that's been the biggest thing for me. And I know we've mentioned Mm -hmm. it several times for both of us uh that the community that we've when we started this thing it was just like okay we like to talk disney our family and friends are tired of us talking disney all the time <laughs> to them uh why don't we just kind of get together and we'll talk disney and have a little fun and we'll see if anybody actually wants to listen uh and you know it, it's been great like i said yeah. the, the downloads keep going up it's fantastic but more than anything else we've made so many great friends so many great connections uh because of this podcast mm-hmm. the disney community has been amazing and uh thank you again so much yeah so, awesome uh, yeah so uh, before we get into our main stuff of this week, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about where I think I want to try and get into some Disney Plus stuff uh, week in and week mm-hmm. out. And there's a couple of things that we actually talked about last week, but we had some weird recording issues <laughs> that even though we talked about them, I had to edit them out because they're messed up because they started like, oh, uh, 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 what? They're like that. <laughs> Sounds like when I normally talk with you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what Michelle hears from me. No, no, I was thinking how I come across. So. <laughs> You're so kind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, we'll start off with, yes, we talked about this last week, but we're going to talk about it again this week because you didn't hear it. Uh, Once Upon a Snowman was uh, the right. uh, little frozen Olaf uh, short that came out last week, and we just loved very much. It was so adorable. Uh, well, adorable was the word I was going to use, too. So yeah, it was really cute. Uh, I thought it was very creative how they incorporated the original film footage as well into that and just kind of had more of a focused perspective of Olaf during it and uh, showed more of his hilarity and his fun spirit. Right. And I love how they brought in like little glimpses of the various songs that happened uh, during that kind of time period right. there. We had a little more of Oaken uh, there, which was a <laughs> right. lot of fun as well. I just enjoyed it. It was short. It was really, really short. And mm-hmm. I thought it was going to go on for longer because it, you know, there's like a lot of credits at the end. Yeah. It says 12 minutes. It's really only like seven or eight, you know, right. but uh, it really was still cute just the same. And you know me, Absolutely. hashtag real men love frozen. I enjoyed <laughs> the heck out of it. So that's so cool. Uh, another thing that we're watching week in and week out that we're really enjoying is the right stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of the, uh, it's not real. Uh, it's based on a true story, right. based on the, the book that came out a long time ago. And then there was also the movie, right. the right stuff that came out. I think it was really early in the eighties, maybe even late seventies, but I think it was really early in the eighties about the Mercury astronauts. Mm-hmm. And um, we're really enjoying that every single week that that comes out as well. Right. Yeah. I, I like that. It's not identical to the movie. It's giving a little bit more, um, 
interesting perspective on some of the personalities and relationships of those uh, as early astronauts together. I think that's a different perspective than what we've gotten from the movie. And so it makes it a little bit more intriguing of, you know, how some of those interactions really were intricate into the actual program. For sure. For sure. So uh, really cool stuff. I'm totally enjoying the right stuff. Every week it comes out. We're usually mm -hmm. watching it either the very first night it comes out or the second day. Um, it's it's really fascinating. Now, let's talk about what we watched a couple of times the first day it came out. <laughs> Hello, baby Yoda. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear him, but he's saying hi to you. You'll be able to see him uh, if you watch this on the YouTube <laughs> channel. We have, if you may have seen, I posted on social media. Uh, we have a new member of the Hyperion Adventures podcast family. <laughs> it is the child, and there he is. He's doing the way magic hand thing right there. <laughs> um, and we're... We're so happy to have him as part of our Hyperion Adventures family. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about The Mandalorian uh, Season 2, Episode 1. We're not going to give any spoilers just in case you haven't watched it yet. I would imagine most of you have by the time this show comes out. But just in case you haven't, we're not going to give any spoilers right. away. But uh, I'll just go with Michelle first. What were, did your, what were your impressions of the first episode of Season 2? <laughs> I think the child is getting on to this too. Um, yeah, I thought it was phenomenal, first of all. Um, very much, I, I think actually a little bit more in depth, maybe just because I'm noticing some more details of the real essence of a Western, oh. <laughs> um, you know, being brought out, whether you're looking at some of the um, the types of uh, guns mm -hmm. that they're you know or weaponry that they're using the way they sometimes communicate when there's a language barrier mm -hmm. um you know s just some of the feel of a of real true early western kind of style of of the storytelling mm -hmm. and um speaking of storytelling i just think it's phenomenal just love the characters. They keep bringing in more characters that are ones that you like. You're like, oh, I hope this person comes in another episode. Mm -hmm. And being surprised when somebody else does come back, like, mm -hmm. yay, glad <laughs> that person made it back in another episode. And, you know, so just a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I uh, completely agree with you on the Western aspect. Uh, you know, The Mandalorian, even in season one, mm -hmm. was very much a uh, Western set in the Star Wars universe, a spaghetti Western, mm -hmm. pretty much. Also, you can consider it kind of a samurai Western, kind right. of the Kurosawa type stuff. Uh, and uh, it was some of it was more nuanced. Some of it was flat out. You could just tell, yes, that's a, definitely a Western right now. This episode was Western. I yes. mean, like you, it was like everything, every Western trope you could think of almost uh, was kind of in this episode, but it played off well. It's one of the things I love about mm -hmm. The Mandalorian is that uh, it can be this Western and you can tell it's a Western, but it still feels fully entrenched within the Star Wars universe. Right, right. Like, you know, you're still within Star Wars, even though this is Definitely. playing out very much like many classic Westerns uh, you've seen. There was lots of wonderful Easter eggs and mm -hmm. some even some, you know, some fan service in this episode. And uh, but I like that it's not like that's just it's just smacking you in the face all the time with that. They just like to pepper it in there every once in a while. And, right. you know, everybody who knows what some of this stuff is or you know just oh 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 right that. exactly you know it's just so fun and i i love that about that and like you mentioned um and right now favreau and filoni they're they're just telling the best stories mm -hmm. in star wars i think uh, across the universe right now the star wars universe um they are just doing such a fantastic job with this series it's amazing i mm -hmm. get excited for it every single week it comes out um i we've already watched it three times uh <laughs> this three one or four. yeah well i'm sure it'll be four as soon as we get done <laughs> recording this because uh it's been so great um and also you know go back and watch season one Again, uh, go back and watch mm -hmm. Disney Gallery, The Mandalorian, all great stuff. And, and I just can't wait for the next episode to see where we go from here. Right. Would it be a spoiler to say that there is also one little piece that is Sharknado? To, at least that's <laughs> what I felt like. Oh, Sharknado. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle is a Sharknado fan. Yes. Uh, and there is one piece that felt a little Sharknado-ish uh, in a funny way, you know, but in a way that made sense in the storyline. Right. But, uh, yeah, not really spoilery. But <laughs> look out for that. Yeah, and people see may if you had the see same impression not, yeah. if you watch Sharknado, right. you know, which is. And if you have it, what are you waiting for? <laughs> yeah, why aren't you watching these absolutely terrible movie? Awesome. Awesomely awesome. terrible movie. Yes. The first one. Eh, the rest of them. The first one, though. <laughs> awesomely terrible. <laughs> Come on. 
Come awesome on. They even travel. had one, The Fourth Awakens. Yeah. This Come is... on. It was a great episode. <laughs> Are we going to get into a shark needed discussion? Look, the first one was funny because they weren't intending it to be as bad as it was, but it was so bad that it was hilariously funny. After that, they knew of what they had in there, so they were playing it up a little bit more. So I think, and I think that plays into it, but the, the first one. Why are we talking Sharknado? This is a Disney podcast. Let's get back to what we're talking right. about today. <laughs> uh, lots of stuff for this week, including we now know who may be playing the lead role in an intriguing upcoming Marvel Disney Plus series. And it sounds like it's someone who's making the jump from one popular universe to another mm. we'll talk about who that might be and what's going on with that and could disney cruise be sailing soon no maybe we'll talk a little bit about that but let's get to our main topic of the week So yes, this week we're going through a little time traveling again. We've already brought you Disney in the 80s, Disney in the 90s. This week we're going to bring you Disney in the 2000s. And of course, if we're going to do that, we're going to go with Michelle because, well, look at her. She's wonderful, awesome, all things that are great in the world. But she does wonderful research. She is our Hyperion Adventures historian. <laughs> So I'm sure she'll have some fascinating facts that may bring up, uh, you know, it'd be a little stroll down memory lane, bring up some memories for you of your time going to Disney parks or watching Disney movies or whatever it may be in the 2000s. So Michelle, please tell us a little bit about Disney in the 2000s. All right. Well, that was a big build up. Thank you very much for that kind uh, compliments there. I think maybe it's just I'm um, channeling my desire to have been like the Disney archivist <laughs> person like Dave Smith. <laughs> if you're hiring. Disney, by yeah. the way, I'm, she's available. That's right. Uh, <laughs> so one of the finds that we did have over the weekend was this Fantasia 2000 commemorative coin. Ooh. Um, yeah, for Fantasia 2000, cool. right? Yeah. So, um, and that kind of to me was a little bit symbolic because that's really how the new year rang in uh, for the Disney company and actually for for us over here uh, with the Rose Bowl Parade. Mm -hmm. It was the kickoff, um, you know, where they have some uh, dancers and performers at the beginning and they did a tribute to Fantasia 2000, which was kicking off uh, obviously in the new millennium and uh, actually made for IMAX theater. So that's how they kind of rang in the new year. Uh, and it was a great way to introduce that new film. And the, the rest of that decade continued to have a lot of great films. I mean, just in 2001, well, there's an, and there's no way I'm going to name all of them. You can always go and find online all of them that, that came out. But, you know, some of the ones that were memorable for 2000 also were The Tigger Movie, which is uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dinosaur, uh, Remember the Titans. Oh, yeah. And The Emperor's New Groove. Oh, yeah. That's, a, that's kind of a fan favorite, you know, from a lot of people grew up in that era or right around that age. And a lot of people love The Emperor's New Groove. Right. I think it's a cute movie. I, it, it's not one of the best, in right. my opinion. Don't, don't hate me. Right. Uh, but I, it, it still is fun. I enjoy it. I put it on at night, you know, in case you sure. to watch it. I think it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny film. Right. There's some parts of it that are underrated uh -huh. in terms of hilarity uh, and character. But I, you know, I'm kind of in line with you on that. Um, so, I, and I won't go through all of them, but do you have any come to mind for that decade movies that were really either your favorites or highlights well i think that that era i mean really pixar at least especially at the beginning of it with pixar oh yeah she's wearing a pixar shirt here which you'll be able to see on the youtube video yes. uh yeah i think pixar really took off with a lot of, i mean you know mm -hmm. our relationship took off in the early 2000s for right. one thing so right. um but you know in one of our our first really movie date was to go see monsters inc mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. one has a uh soft space in my heart right. you know, because we we love that movie but so many you know wally -E and mm -hmm. uh, finding nemo and right. uh there were just some great pixar films disney films um i think they kind of hit a little 
speed bump uh, in the at least in the early two mm-hmm. thousands. At least as far as the animated films, they weren't some of my favorites. You know, for the most part, Lilo and Stitch was pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of enjoyed Lilo and Stitch. Uh, and later on in the decades, you know, some of the live action like Enchanted is from that uh, right. time period, and mm-hmm. I love Enchanted very much. I right. think that was a film that I really enjoyed. Right. What so, about you? Uh, well, I agree with you with Pixar, and Pixar is going to come into play in a lot. Uh, on this conversation of this decade because there was a lot of things surrounding that, not just the actual films, but um, with with some of the leadership uh, of the organization. Um, but I agree with you. They had a lot of great, wonderful hits. I mean, you named a lot of them. Uh, Cars was also a, mm-hmm. a wonderful one that came out um, and Up came out as yeah. well. Uh, some of the other live actions that were pretty cool were the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean series. Oh, yeah, series. of course. Of course. We love that series. Right. Um, I remember seeing that. I think I was in Hawaii visiting my son and had some time to kill before I was flying back to the mainland. You weren't with me and I went and saw that in the theater and I came back and told you, this movie's fantastic. We weren't <laughs> expecting really right. anything for it. You know, a, a, an attraction based movie, right, you know, exactly. the Curse of the Black Pearl. And I was like, this is great. We have to go see this movie. You're going right. to love it. You know, it took her, took you to yeah, really enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, it was great. Um, you know, another one that doesn't get a lot of, um, I think attention to it, but one that you introduced me to was, uh, and I'm, and I may not say this correctly, uh, bridge to Terabithia, 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 yeah. you know, yeah. really intriguing kind of film. Interesting coming of age type movie. Right. Yeah, you can actually, I think it's, I don't know if it's on Disney plus right now. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I know I saw it on, I think I saw it on HBO or something the other day, but I saw it not that long ago again and I hadn't seen it in years. Right. Either. And I'd be remiss not to mention the Jonas Brother, the 3D concert experience that of came course. out. Of <laughs> course. I'm sure there's a lot of you out there who are totally all wrapped up in that. Um, right, Jonas right. Brothers were extremely popular during that time period, for sure. Exactly. So, you know, looking at how to approach this topic, because there's so many different ways you could go about it. Um, I, I was thinking first that, you know, from our last time we talked about a decade it was the 90s which you know uh, had been pegged the decade of disney you mm-hmm. know and it's when you know there was really a lot of um returning to some of the the roots of the organization uh and bringing michael eisner on as well as some other um leadership mm-hmm. in that in that it's uh, the disney renaissance period exactly mm-hmm. you know and so i was trying to think well how you tag the 2000s you know and there were three key elements when doing the research on this that I came across um, and it it really revolved around the board of directors and uh, you know one of them was Steve Jobs Mm. uh, 9-11 and something that's called Save Disney Campaign Mm. and when I'm looking at that I thought you know what this is a decade of turnaround, mm. turnaround for the organization. And, and there's some really interesting, um, I guess it'd be cruel to say soap opera, <laughs> but relationship issues. Some, some that- backstage <laughs> stuff that uh, maybe came a little bit too much uh, to the front of the stage, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. That kind of drove some things that were going on. And it was all very intriguing and interesting. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Um, but let's start first at looking at things like uh, parks and resorts, the turnaround for some of them and transformation, business growth and acquisitions. And then we'll get into some of these other elements here. Okay. All right. So first in looking at parks and resorts, um, this decade really did have a lot of turnaround, a lot of transformations that we saw. It was the first time in Disney history that they actually opened two parks in one year. Mm. And so that was really early on in the decade where they opened Disney California Adventure Park Mm -hmm. uh, as well as Disney Grand California Resort Hotel. Yeah, they actually just redid that whole area, the downtown Disney right. area, the the hotels, that that whole area was redone exactly. at the early part of that decade. Yeah. It was transformed. It was transformed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but in the same year, uh, Tokyo Disney Sea opened. Mm. So um, that was, and then shortly after that, like the very next year, uh, France opened up the Walt Disney Studio Park. Mm-hmm. Also, so 
Um, the following year, Mission Space opened at Epcot and Pop Century Resort opened, giving another Walt Disney World Resort for people to go to. And uh, the, one of the biggies in 2005 was the opening of uh, Disneyland Hong Kong. Yeah, so the Disney's uh, emergence into China. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, there was also the, the transformation of bringing in Pixar into the parks as well. So we saw um, the opening of uh, Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage at Disneyland, The Seas with Nemo and Friends at Epcot, Finding Nemo the Musical <laughs> at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Getting a theme here. <laughs> I know. And uh, Toy Story Mania at Hollywood Studios and uh, Disney's California Adventure Park. Right. So, um, you know, bringing in a lot of that new um, IP Mm -hmm. to the theming of some of the things in the parks. Yeah, for better or for worse, depending on what your viewpoint is on IP in the parks. I have no problem with any of those attractions and the IP within them. Um, But uh, some people aren't as big a fans as we are of that. True, true. Uh, But I think if you look at at kids, um, you see that they do um, really... Find that's a, their connection right. with the parks, I you know, when they're at the parks. Completely so. agree. So business growth and and acquisitions. Unless there's other things at the parks you want to talk about. No, I think you covered it very well. Mm. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, if you want to look at some of the, if you want to look back at some of the opening of uh, Disney California Adventure Park and the uh, the studios mm-hmm. out at uh, Disneyland Paris, uh, there's some infor- interest- interesting, it's easy for me to say, <laughs> Uh, information there if you go to the Imagineering story right. on uh, uh, on Disney Plus. Um, if you've probably already seen it, but if you want to go back and revisit that, because uh, there was some interesting stuff that went down with those opening of those parks, and they cover that it pretty well within the Imagineering story. Really good stuff. Right. That is very true. So good point, honey. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, DVD releases really started to, you know, take, take hold and really increase. Um, mainly too because Disney was starting to add some additional information into the DVDs. So not only were people able to share with their kids or re re experience these movies, these classic films, but they got information that they didn't have before. So, you know, it it made that marketing uh, for that information Mm -hmm. really a benefit. Um, And giving an example, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs DVD in 2001 sold more than 1 million units on the first day of release. Wow. I know, right? It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, ABC had a rebirth with some of their popular films um, in series like Desperate Housewives, Lost, one yeah, of your favorites. I'm a lostie, I'm a lostie. <laughs> Grey's Anatomy um, on the Disney Channel, High School Musical <laughs> aired and, you know, really became a big hit. Hannah Montana. Hannah Montana. Well, High School Musical was huge too, but Hannah Montana was was really big. Right, yeah, yeah totally, totally. Um, Camp Rock, Kim mm-hmm. Possible, and one of our faves, Phineas and Ferb. That's right, yeah. <laughs> For sure. All started in uh, late in the decade. Yeah, that's right. Uh, not to leave out Broadway. Uh, the Little Mermaid came out in that decade mm. as well. Um, and D23 right. was launched in this decade. The official fan club of exactly. Disney. Exactly. Yeah. And so they actually held their first biannual um, convention in Anaheim. Uh, after years of trying to partner with uh, the Muppets, they finally acquired the Muppets. Yes. <laughs> you know. Now, hashtag save the Muppets. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, Pixar was purchased, and more details of that in a moment. Ooh, that was a big move for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one of the things that I think most people are very excited about, too, at the end of the decade was acquiring uh, Marvel and entertainment and uh, pulling a quote from Bob Iger he says um, the treasure trove of over 5,000 characters offers Disney the ability to do what we do best yeah so yeah, it really did I mean that and there's so many Marvel characters and we're still seeing them um, evolve and debut uh, right. as we go on I have a story later on that I teased already that uh, it has to do with a, a, a Marvel character that has not been seen on the screen before, you right. know, and that we're going to be finding out more about. But there's so many characters we haven't even delved into, some more that may uh, get looked into again. Right. It's, uh, it was a really big thing, you know. I mean, again, adding, uh, and we're going to talk about Pixar, but adding that, adding the Muppets, adding mm-hmm. Marvel, and it just, you know, was where we started to move into with, with Disney as we went forward. Right. So. I mean, let's 
let's face it, they're great storytellers. Mm-hmm. And having more rich characters to tell those stories is just amazing. And, and, you know, what we talked about earlier with The Mandalorian, I mean, it just, they're continuing to do that to, to create new stories to focus on some other characters that may have been more uh, minor or in the background and now bringing their their stories to light. And, you know, I mean, if you look at especially, uh, obviously, we've heard that Disney is looking to reformat a little bit, put more money into the streaming service, into Disney+. Plus. Uh, if you think about it, I mean, what would Disney Plus be if Disney didn't uh, put the money into these things? I mean, right. this is, you know, long before they ever thought about having a streaming service. Exactly. Um, these were putting the pieces in place to be prepared to be able to do that, to have the kind of content that can right. fill out a full streaming service, um, adding them up. It's adding Pixar, adding Marvel. Um, it just that was the beginning of what you now, whenever you put on Disney Plus, you'll see across your screen was a lot right there. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So. All right, you ready to get into some of the juicy stuff? Let's get into the juicy, <laughs> dirty, filthy details. <laughs> have some like soap opera music playing know, in the background? Right? Maybe so, maybe so. You know, it's just, I mean, we're all human. We all have issues and things that we go through. And, you know, um, unfortunately, when you're that famous, you know, and you're you're holding, you know, lead positions in the a company like Disney or on the board of directors, you know, you're kind of under the microscope and, you know, I probably wouldn't ever want to feel as under the microscope as they do or did. Um, and so I, you know, first of all, want to say that, that I recognize people are human. People are entitled to have their experiences. Um, we all make good decisions. We all make bad decisions. Hopefully we learn from some of our bad decisions. And, um, and I think some of that was going on. It's just that what draws people's attention are to some of these other, you know, more focused on, you know, what weren't some of the good things. I guess we've talked about, I mean, especially nowadays, that's the truth. I mean, what is bad out there in the world gets far more showcased than what's good, what's positive in the world. Um, we've talked about it. You know, we wanted to be the, the positive Disney podcast and we've tried to stay with that, you know, and will that draw us, you know, not get us quite as many downloads or probably. clicks or <laughs> possible sponsors, whatever. Um, yeah, probably, but we don't care. That's what we want to be. So, you know, but well, uh, we have to be who we are. But so. yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, and sometimes you're doing something for the right thing and it has a consequence regardless. And so the first thing that, that right out of the gate is, is has to do with that. So technology was really changing for sure in, in, at that time in entertainment industry, whether you're talking film or the music industry um, was very like fear reactionary because they didn't know what to do with some of the things that were happening with technology. And Eisner, who came from the film industry, really had a strong belief of um, copyright laws. And, you know, he really had concerns of some of the things that were going on. And he specifically kind of targeted when he um, did a presentation to Congress, um, the concerns of digital privacy. And he specifically named Apple's rip, mix and burn slogan, Mm. feeling like, um, you know, this is something that's really going to um, hurt the industry. And he also didn't see the, the tech companies doing things to protect privacy in spite of that. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, he was, he was a real proponent of concerns for this. And obviously Steve Jobs, who was heading Apple, (laughs) was not really thrilled about being targeted in this way in a negative light. And so it kind of started a issue with his feelings towards Eisner or or how he feels Eisner didn't respect him. Uh, Totally. So, um, so that was kind of one of, you know, a little you know, start to some of the things. And then there was the issue of Pixar, which Steve Jobs was also the CEO right. of. So, um, so you don't want a rift between the, the, <laughs> the two CEOs if you're trying to come to a deal at right. that time, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. So what happened? So Toy Story was a separate deal um, that was made between Pixar and Disney, and then they came up with um, a new deal before the decade started that would have a, a a relationship between the two companies to produce five digital, pure digital um, animated films. And um, that was the arrangement. And, uh, you know, being such a startup company, 
Pixar was willing to let most of the leverage go to the side of Disney. In the fact, big, the big name. Right, right. And that, you know, that they felt that they were linking onto this organization. They were going to grow from it. But right now they had to let Disney hold more of the marbles, including to have the rights to all the sequels of these five films. Mm-hmm. So keeping that in mind. So uh, they, they, they have that deal going into place. And then... Um, they, they have big successes with, obviously, Toy Story and Bugs Life. Mm-hmm. And this kind of made Steve Jobs start thinking, huh, we're, we're, this company, Pixar, is good. And mm-hmm. we're printing out really good content. And Disney needs to recognize that. And whether it was real or perceived, his perception was that Disney just felt they were a hired hand, mm-hmm. that they just didn't give them the recognition of being, you know, a, a spectacular company. And so that was kind of starting to also not Steve Jobs. So there's another thing, you know, building on this issue with how he felt about the Disney company and specifically Michael Eisner. Now, those films came out in the 90s, but they did lead to where we're going in the 2000s. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Thank you for pointing mm-hmm. that out. Um, So here's where the problem really became pronounced. Toy Story 2, which was originally, it is a sequel, and it was originally planned to go directly to video. Mm -hmm. But, and there's a lot of reasons. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details, but it was decided by both companies that this film will go to the big screen. And so because it was so successful, Steve Jobs felt Disney should count this as one of the five films that they were going to make. Um, and whether this was a power struggle or just, you know, Eisner trying to just say, well, here's our contract and our contract says sequels don't count. So we're not going to count this. You still have to go still meet the original five original films. And that was another thing Mm -hmm. that really gnawed at Steve Jobs and really impacting his feeling towards Disney and I. Well, Steve Jobs is such an easygoing guy anyway, right? You know, I mean, yes. nothing ever bothered him. He's just like, oh, yeah, let it go. It's all good. Let it go. I know. Yeah. No. No. By now, he was really being pretty ticked off at yeah. the whole situation, you know, and really feeling like, uh, again, Disney was not recognizing them for what they were producing and just felt like. And from Pixar's perspective, they felt like Disney's just kind of acting like a a distribution and marketing campaign for them and not really collaborating with them. That's, again, these are perceptions and people are entitled to perceptions, Mm -hmm. but that's what was kind of going on. So um, anyways, you know, as I mentioned, he just continued, there just continued to be this riff. And so when it came time to the original deal was done and they were trying to look at negotiating another deal, which might include even Disney purchasing Pixar. Um, Steve Jobs was not going to make this an easy go of it. And he created an offer that even Bob Iger later said would have been fiscally irresponsible if Eisner had accepted that offer. So, you know, Eisner said no to it. He made counter offers that were continually, you know, refused by Steve Jobs. And this fight just started to become more and more prevalent in, in, you know, the media, more importantly, with the board of directors of Disney. And it started, you know, shining some doubt on Eisner being a negotiator anymore is he you know losing that that ability to really be able to 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 do that not just with Pixar but concerns for the future Mm -hmm. so make sense that totally makes sense I I can see where that would be an issue especially you know when you know Pixar right at that point was honestly they were putting out better movies than Disney was animated wise anyway you know at that moment in time and so it's like why wouldn't Pixar feel stronger about what their placement is within the company, you know, and want to sure. have more reins over this? And, you know, and Disney would, of course, want them around. But, you know, it's always been Disney is the, you know, the, the, the big boy on the block, you know, I mean, right. they want to make sure and, and, and have their, you know, they feel like they should be 
in that role as as the chief. You sure. Know, so it's, it's it had to be a tough position it, to be in. Yeah, you know. definitely. You know, and you know, again, like you mentioned, these two very you know strong you know that everybody has egos uh individuals you know feeling like each other's bullying each other and you know like you're saying yeah. um pixar can- eisner and jobs and, uh, <laughs> I know. egos i know what? right you know i mean you can understand oh sorry baby yoda um you know you can you can under kind of understand too from a disney perspective that they had the rights to the sequels. So they could also create great stories right. with those characters that were already produced by Pixar, you know? And so you could argue on both yeah, sides. Yeah, you of could this. see you both really sides could. of it. You could, for sure. There's no you question know. about that. So, but now throw in another episode in history 9 11. Oh. <laughs> big, a big, major th- episode. yeah, major episode turns everything up on on its heels. You know, talk about you know the issue of safety, like you know, kind of what we're all experiencing now. What's the issue of safety and going into a park and feeling safe? And that's you know one of the things we've talked about, even when we've um, had issues related to the parks reopening. What does Disney do to make sure people feel safe right. going to their parks? And obviously, with nine eleven. You know, that was a big concern is, is, you know, one of the Disney parks going to be a target, Mm -hmm. you know, for terrorism. So, you know, there was that. And just in in general, I mean, the the travel industry took a hit during that time significantly. The airlines, the cruise ships, everything, they all took hits. The hotel industry, no one felt completely safe. Just kind of, it's very similar in a completely different way to what we're seeing now in, in regards, you know. Exactly. So, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details about 9-11 and everything that happened. You know, you, you've mentioned some of the things already, too. But, you know, what it did was it really uh, impacted the stock market and especially for Disney. And Eisner really started to feel the weight of all these things coming about mm-hmm. and concerned and, you know, talk about transformation his demeanor starts becoming more and more pessimistic and you know making decisions more fear-based versus you know future looking kind of way and so then you throw on top of it Roy Disney (laughs) (laughs) and again this is like a story in of itself it's kind of very much like what you know when we saw Waking Sleeping Beauty right it's all these personalities and and issues and you know and even though Roy Disney is the one that brought Eisner in, mm-hmm. you know, was really instrumental in bringing Eisner in, he started really doubting Eisner's um, devotion to the organization as he saw the mm-hmm. Disney, you know, traditions. Now, this is this is Roy E. Disney, Roy, right? The, right. The uh, nephew. The nephew. Walt's nephew, right. Right. And, he, you know, he just felt, you know, his role in everything was to keep that Disney tradition alive. And he felt some of the acquisitions that Eisner had been making you know, was bringing non-Disney folk into the mix and questioning and even some of the things that, you know, the organizations that they brought in, not that they were bad, but just not what he felt was pure Disney. Mm -hmm. And so now you start having somebody on the board that's really vocal Mm -hmm. and having some issues and conflicts in, in, or, or, you know, issues with decision making mm-hmm. with Eisner. So as you see, there's all these, um, you know, rifts coming about, coming about in this decade. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it really started to be a problem. So it got to be a point where Roy, uh, he and a fellow board member, Stanley Gold, decide that they're going to openly question Eisner and their concerns about him. And um, it really just, they they just, they were relentless Mm. at bringing this up. And, you know, not just at board meetings, but openly discussing their disdain for Michael Eisner and where he was taking the company. And it really hit a breaking point for Eisner. And so one of the things which he does is with contracts is he's going to say, what's the letter of the law? And he found a clause in the board of directors that had never been utilized, which was mandatory retirement from the board at age 72. Oh, my goodness. So he saw this as a way <laughs> to get Roy out of the picture. Wow. I know, right? So... And instead of him actually going to Roy and talking to him about this, he got the um, chairman of the nomination committee to be the one to 
to give the information to Roy. And so that individual had to tell Roy that you're not going to be up for re-election onto the board. And at the next shareholder meeting, you will be retired. Wow. I know. <laughs> that's some dirty laundry right I there. I know, yeah. right? So obviously that's not going to make Roy very really? happy. <laughs> oh, good. I can go lay on the beach. I can go relax. Exactly. Know. Here's the person who's thinking he's the, the one and only Disney left to really hold the torch. And now he's being ousted right. by his own company. Yeah. yeah not going to make by the him person happy. he brought helped bring in by the way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So obviously you're going to think that's not going to go well. That's right? not going to fly. Right. <laughs> so, Roy and Stanley decide to write a letter um, blasting Michael Eisner, and they had it slipped under the door <laughs> at his apartment. <laughs> What's that? I know. <laughs> you just got a letter. You just, just got, got a letter. letter. I know, right? <laughs> I know. I mean, it's really incredible. So, um, you know, some of the shenanigans that were going on. So um, the, the two former board members actually um, resigned and they launched a Save Disney campaign. Mm. And they were really going all out to pr promote public pressure to oust Michael Eisner, mm. you know. And so uh, this was, again, you know, we thought it was going on when Roy was part of the board. And once he was off the board, he was more vocal. Yes, more vocal. And really, you know, putting the board of directors actually at, at a, in a position of how do we respond to this? Because this same Disney is not the board of directors. But it's coming this. with a guy with Disney in his name. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so um, then on top of that, Comcast, which is, was really big at the time, decide that they're going to do a hostile bid <laughs> to take over and purchase Disney. Wow. And interestingly, because now we know of Disney Plus, their thought was, hey, there's a ton of content and we're the biggest cable company. Yeah. We have, if we buy Disney, we can have this to put out on right. cable. Right. So interesting how they had that foresight, but it, it didn't go through. There's a lot of things. Obviously. That, yeah, it, obviously it didn't go through. But again, here's more bad publicity, more things going that the board is having to deal with. I mean, can you believe all this stuff? No. Can you imagine if there was social media during that time, I how know. crazy it would be? We you know if any little news, anything a little happens, even whether it's true or not, uh, it pops up on social media and everybody goes crazy. Could right. you imagine if all this stuff was happening in social media? We're out there as well. I know, I know. So, um, when the shareholders, the next shareholder meeting comes up, obviously, um, you know, the, the board has to address some of the things going on in the media and, you know, they're trying to shine light on where the company is going, some great things happening. Um, but instead they're dealing with, with the drama of what's unfolding out there. And so That's some drama, too. right, some right. Serious drama. And so actually, um, there was a 43% no, um, no confidence vote hmm. of Michael Eisner. Wow. I know. And in fact, uh, they they said that they they gave the, in raw numbers versus percentage to try to make it not sound so bad, but obviously it really is bad. So it's a uh, lot of shareholders for forty three percent. Right, That's right, a lot. right. So you know we think those things only happen in Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> but no confidence. No confidence vote. So. Uh, that me so Mike Gleiser knew, you know, he saw the writing on the wall. So he uh, sends a letter to the board in 2004, and he says, you know, he's not going to renew his contract at in 2006. He's going to step down. And um, the board had already um, named a new chairman. They still let Eisner be CEO, but they named a new chairman of the board instead of Michael Eisner. Mm. Um, so now that's happening. Here's Michael Eisner, who's COO, second in command. And obviously, you know, you would think he'd want the job, which he did. You're talking about Bob Iger. Bob Iger. Right. What did I say? I, I think he said Michael Eisner. I'm sorry. Maybe he didn't. Maybe I didn't. I'll, I'll check the, I'll check it. Maybe. Take two. Okay. Bob Iger, number two, CEO. <laughs> COO <laughs> is, is there. And so he goes to the board of directors because he's a smart dude. And he says, look, 
Michael Eisner is now a lame duck. Hmm. And if you if you want me not to also be a lame duck, you need to publicly announce that one, I'm a contender for this, and two, that you have confidence that you're going to allow me to to do some some things for this company and not just stay around and wait for you to find a replacement. Yeah, not just be sitting there, yeah. you know, just filling a seat essentially. Right, right? exactly. And so, um, you know, he had some he had some people on the board who was very favorable to him, some that weren't, and there was, you know, some in the middle, you know. And so, um, but they did understand why he was making that announcement. So, you know, they really did throw in support and they actually mentioned that he was the only internal candidate that they were considering. Um, and in 2005, they actually did decide, uh, after a long set of interviews, et cetera, um, that they would make him CEO of the company. Mm. So, <sighs> and the company was much better for it. Right. At least that's right. our opinion on it. I sure. know there's some people that weren't crazy about Bob Iger being in that role, but I, I think the majority of people and definitely us, right. um, think that that was the exactly a brilliant move exactly and the right move. exactly you know it had to be very tough i mean you know it, it was some somebody who had been associated with the leadership that was already being at, under attack and even though he wasn't eisner he was still part of that team you know and he was you know uh, walking a tightrope there of you know you don't want to just bash the other person completely and that doesn't help so you know he really did use a lot of great resources to figure out how to how to really self-market you mm -hmm. know to get into that position and so he was successful and very shortly after that he was able to um, mend relationships with Steve Jobs and secure a deal to actually purchase Pixar and was well, he successful had a in much that. better relationship with Steve Jobs than oh, Michael yeah. Eisner. Right? Oh, so, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And they be, they actually, their friendship really grew, especially, um, you know, getting closer to, um, Steve Jobs passing away. There was a, you know, a lot of camaraderie. They were meeting together frequently uh, as friends as well as, as colleagues. So, um, you know, it was, it was really, to me, it's, this whole decade was kind of like, you know, and it was tumultuous. It started it was. off in a tumultuous way and it continued on through much of it. Exactly. Right? And so, you know, sounding maybe poetic or corny, it's, it's kind of like the Phoenix out of the ashes. <laughs> the company came out through stronger. And like I said, at the end of the decade, they, they purchased Marvel. Uh, they started getting things in the work for Lucasfilm. So, um, secured Pixar back with right. them and actually bought out Pixar. Yes, so now they yes. were a Disney company, you know, and just to give you some, um, perspective of the Pixar deal, Pixar was more expensive than either Lucas or Marvel to purchase. And uh, so there, there you, you go. go. So that was the decade <laughs> of, of, the of the turnaround for the Disney company. Wow. That's some really great information there. I mean, really some stuff that I'm sure many of you didn't know that was going on. Uh, so much interesting uh you know, backstage deals right, and stuff right. that was happening. And some of this was out there. And I know we've seen a little bit of this in like the Imagineering story mm -hmm. and some other things. Uh, I think you got some of that information off of Bob Iger's book. Right, uh, that right. came out last year. Um, but that's really fascinating stuff. Really, really cool. What, yeah. Uh, what, so, you know, just get on a lighter note here. I mean, that was great information. I knew none of that, or not none of it, but very little of right. that. So that's uh, fascinating to find out what was going on at that time. What did, was your kind of the, your, what do you think of Disney in the 2000s? I know you talked about mm -hmm. me with the movies and talked a little bit about what you like in the movies, but like the parks and whatever. Right. I think I was kind of in a period in the early 2000s um, until I met you and mm -hmm. I started my Disney love started reemerging again because right. you love Disney so much that I didn't get a lot of that stuff. I still saw the movies occasionally, right. you know, but I wasn't fully engulfed in Disney. Uh, but you still were. So, what were your kind of impressions of Disney in the early two thousands, especially? Um, I, there were some things that I I found intriguing. You know, I think the whole Touchstone and some of the movies that were coming out from Touchstone started in the nineties, but moved right, much right. more into the two thousands. Exactly, yeah. and you know, taking more and more risk doing R rated movies and mm -hmm. things like that. I thought, um, I wondered if it was going to be a detriment, but I thought Disney also did a great job of, they really didn't highlight 
Touchstone is one. I mean, uh, my brother said this once. It's um, Disney wants you to know Touchstone is theirs, but they don't want you to know right. that Touchstone exactly. is part of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it's kind of like yeah, it's 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 potentially giving you really great content still. But it is a, a deviation from, you know, maybe what, what might be considered pure Disney right. style. Right. You don't look at some of these movies, you know, they think Disney movie. Right. You don't shout Disney movie. Right. right. Exactly. Um, for me, too, I think a lot of the love of Disney had to do with the parks. Mm-hmm. And it was exciting to see, you know, things happening. You, you know, you heard before this decade things were in the works, you know, but actually seeing them come to fruition was really exciting and fun and knowing that, hey, Hey, there's other things to to continue to to want to have an opportunity to experience. Whether mm-hmm. you're talking, you know, Disney Sea or Hong Kong Disneyland, you mm-hmm. know, um, you know, we got to see California Adventure Park from the beginning and saw it evolve. Too. Yeah, I remember um, I was working at our, my first radio station that I worked at at the time, and uh, it's, you know, most radio stations have some sort of advertising tie in kind of with mm-hmm. Disney, especially in Southern California, Disneyland. Uh, and so we, I was there with my program director and he was talking about, he'd saw this stuff that was all the things that they're planning to do right. at Disneyland. This is in the uh, mid late nineties. And I was like, wow, that looks really great. And then when it actually came about uh, in the early two thousands, mm-hmm. you know, it was really cool. I mean, yeah. Um, California adventure was not what people were hoping for when right. it opened up. It's not, it, it you know, you can go to the Imagineering story and hear all about it. Uh, they cut some corners. It wasn't, ex- but still it was another park in California. Right. It was more that you could do. Um, and it made it a full fledged resort in California. Exactly. That's kind of cool. So, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 And eventually uh, they added rooms that were part of the Disney vacation club. So, I mean, it was, you know, really great start to a lot of fun things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what were you like? What was your favorite kind of attraction? In the Disney parks in the early 2000s that maybe came around or was just one of those things you really loved. Well, I think Toy Story Mania yeah. was just a blast, yeah. you know. And still it, is. It's still it still is favorites. fun, yeah. And and I think that was really great seeing it. Um, it. It was interesting. I remember thinking even, you know, with that, that, gee, why isn't Pixar coming out more and more in the parks? And I was glad to see that that started happening more and more because yeah. I, th- I, again, felt that that was such a... Um, had great characters and a lot of fun associated and why not have that? And I think especially at Disneyland, they really embraced that. Yeah. And like I said, in the 2000s, especially at the beginning of the 2000s, Pixar was putting out the far better films. Right. There was no question about it. I mean, there's a lot of people who love a lot of these uh, early 2000s Disney movies. They, you know, they grew up with them. Mm-hmm. They, you know, that was their thing. But if you really look at it, you know, as far as w- with how critical acclaim and, you know, th- if the, characters and everything else Pixar was making the more lasting films in the 2000s and right. so it was good to see that them starting to make appearances in the parks and to you know and Disney to fully well being one being able to fully embrace right. them but also then you know doing so right interestingly um, Pixar was their focus was quality over quantity and I think that's why you know Disney was was churning a True. lot of movies where Pixar might only do one in that same time span. So yeah. I think that's why we did see these really great movies. Yeah, agreed. So. Agreed. They were great. So uh, great stuff. Michelle's research, always the best. <laughs> so good stuff. <laughs> I did throw out there on the newsletter and uh, a little bit on uh, social media today, um, you know, some imp- to ask for some listener input on what your favorite moments were of the 2000s. Uh, and then we did get a couple of responses. Uh, Doug Stevenson who is a subscriber to the newsletter. He hit us up with an email. He said, hi, Tom and Michelle. Uh, Very excited for this topic. Uh, Adolescent phase of my life during this decade. So it's definitely full of nostalgia. When DCA opened in 2001, I cannot ever forget how bare bones the park was, as we were just (laughs) talking about. Uh, Still love Soren and my beloved uh, California screaming, uh, rest in peace, was still there. Uh, Pixar Pier is fine, but just doesn't have the original charm. Uh, to me as Paradise Pier had. Everybody has their own feeling right, on right. some of these things, right? Uh, the gaudy, obnoxious touristy decor and sometimes make me miss it, but uh, the Buena Vista Street area is absolutely gorgeous and a perfect addition to the entrance of the park nowadays. Uh, Superstar Limo, look it up, kids. He said, 
<laughs> arguably one of the worst attractions ever to grace a Disney park, uh, in my opinion. There's some people who loved it. They loved it as, you know, Superstar Limo. It was just right. a weird thing to me. Uh, in 2007, he went on to say, I went to, for my grad night celebration with my class and hundreds of others. To this day, I'm still trying to get Justin Timberlake's summer love out of my mind. <laughs> They kept playing a loop, maybe 20 songs. You get the picture. A very fun experience of uh, to spend time with your classmates at the happiest place on earth. And finally, uh, my wife Sarah and I spent our honeymoon at the Disneyland Resort in January of 2009. Uh, We had the, quote, Disney bug, end quote, as Trent says from Disney DNA (laughs) podcast. Yes, he's known for saying that for sure. So. Uh, he says you you can pick and choose any you want to share. I shared them all. Uh, I know this is a lot. Thanks for as always, guys. I have a great weekend. Happy Halloween and also Merry Christmas, November first. Yay! Yay. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, Doug. I appreciate always uh, your input on the shows. Uh, we also got hit by on Twitter by Cam Ray. You can find him at cam ray he said uh, we went to hollywood studios the last year they had the christmas lights they had mm. to tear up the streets down to build the galaxies that uh, was in the uh the studio backlog right. tour uh to build galaxy's edge so he's not too upset about that <laughs> uh he said it was magical yeah he's talking about the uh, osborne family right. lights that were mm-hmm. uh, fan favorite for many years um into the 2010s right. but uh, yeah started with him i may have started right in the late 90s but definitely through the 2000s so uh, very cool stuff yeah so, and if you have some more memories of the 2000s please hit us up uh, through our social media or through our gmail account and we'll be happy to share them on a future show most definitely Once again, Michelle, thank you for taking us on another (laughs) time-traveling trip, a journey down memory lane of the 2000s. What a tumultuous decade that was for Disney, Uh, for sure. But a lot of great things have come from it, the Disney that we know today. Yes. uh, A lot of the roots for it. Like you said, the turnaround uh, happened during that time period. Right, exactly. So very cool. Uh, Let's get to quickly to the Disney stories of the week. I only have a couple for you this week. I'm going to start with, we may now know who will be playing the lead role in an intriguing upcoming movie. Marvel Plus, uh, Marvel Disney Plus series, and it sounds like it's someone who is making the jump from one popular universe to another. Really, yeah. do tell. Yeah, this from Deadline.com. With his time in the Star Wars franchise coming to an end, Oscar Isaac, aka Poe Dameron, mm. set his sights on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Deadline is hearing he is in negotiations to star as the title character in Moon Knight, wow. the Marvel and Disney Plus series based on the comic book hero. Uh, Jeremy Slater, who developed and wrote Netflix's series adaptation the, uh, of the Umbrella Cat Academy comic books, has been tapped to develop and lead the writing team of the series for the streamer. Uh, Moon Knight, a.k.a. Mark Spector, is a mercenary who has numerous alter egos, Cabbie Jake Lockley and millionaire playboy Stephen Grant (laughs) uh, in order to better fight the criminal underworld. But later he was established as being a conduit for the Egyptian moon god. I don't know if I'm going to get this right. Konchu. Konchu? Konchu. Wow. (laughs) Most recently the character uh, was a consultant who dresses in all white and goes by the name of Mr. Knight. So so that's kind of cool that uh, if this is true, if this does follow suit, and uh, Deadline's been pretty accurate on this stuff so far wow. uh, that uh, Oscar Isaac is going to be part of the Marvel Universe. Very cool. Well, you know, I mean, he also knows John Favreau, who's, you know, part of the Iron of, Man. Yeah, also uh, is, is a, a character bit. within the Marvel Universe himself. <laughs> and Star Wars. And, yeah. 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 Very good. Very cool. So very cool. All one big happy family. Yeah. So uh, the story went on to say Marvel and Disney Plus has been ramping up their development slate as Isaac joins Tatiana Maslany, who we've talked about, mm-hmm. who was recently tapped to play She-Hulk and Iman Vellani, who was named uh, the new Miss Marvel. And WandaVision, of course, should be debuting sometime Woo! here within the next couple months. So Yay! that's exciting as well. So uh, really cool, I think, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. Actually, we're going to probably talk a lot about this next week. Um, this upcoming year on Disney Plus could be the year of Marvel. There is a lot of True. stuff coming yeah. uh, up Exciting. the chute for sure. So, uh, or down the chute, I guess. Uh, is that down the chute? Down the chute? Up the chute? Down the chute? Whatever. Either way, <laughs> in the chute. In the chute. 
open the chute, whatever it could be. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, could Disney Cruise Line be sailing again soon? Well, there was no definitive news on that, but there were steps made this week toward that end. Yeah. Uh, this from the Disney Cruise Line blog. On October 30th, the day before the no-sale order was set to expire, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, issued a framework for conditional sailing order for cruise ships, which means an end to the no sail order. Yay. Yeah. This order will allow a phased approach to resuming cruise ship passenger operations in U.S. waters, opening up a pathway to resume cruising operations. That's exciting. Now, this may sound a little dry because this is from the actual CDC <laughs> um, report here. So it says uh, the order shall remain in effect until the earliest of. Uh, the expiration of the Secretary of Health and Human Services declaration that COVID-19 constitutes a public health emergency. I'm not even going to talk yeah. about the rest of this. <laughs> they said basically that this is, you know, the no sale order is done right now, but there are steps that have to be made to make this go forward. So here are some of the steps that they talked about. So the initial phases will consist of testing and additional safeguards for crew members. Of course, they mm -hmm. want to make sure crew members are safe First, uh, the, CDNC, the CDC will ensure cruise ship operators have adequate health and safety precautions for crew members while these cruise ship operators build the laboratory capacity needed to test future passengers. Wow. So testing sounds like mm -hmm. this will be a big part of what's going to go forward with the cruise ship happening. Uh, subsequent phases will include simulated voyages to test cruise ship operators' ability to mitigate COVID-19 risk, certification for ships that meet specific requirements, and a phase return to cruise ship passenger voyages in a manner that mitigates COVID-19 risk among passengers, crew members, and U.S. communities. So basically what they're saying is that we've gotten rid of the no sale order right. but there are still some steps that the cruise ships need to prove to do right. that they can that before they're completely cleared to do these cruises and it sounds like what it's going to start is is first day CDC has to clear these ships and say you have a, all the right things in place right. that all the ca the crew the cast members or whatever on Disney cruises on the other cruise lines right. uh, are safe on there and when you welcome aboard guests that it'll be okay for them to be able to get them tested right. and make sure they're clear and then they're going to test it out with some little small cruises it sounds like with some either uh, volunteers or some um, some cast members sailing as like cruise ship right. um, guests aboard to prove that yes okay we can do this right. without it being a widespread you know it's not going to do uh, you know, we're not going to have a super spreader event right, on right. one of these ships. And then once they do that, they'll be able to do a few more things. It's it's going to be, like they said, a phased reopening, but at least it's a first step in the right direction. Right. That is exciting, as I mentioned. And, you know, it is great that, you know, a lot of care is being made to to ensure everybody's safety. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that's really key. And, um, Glad to hear that we're making progress. Right. So I wouldn't expect if you're, you know, still have a sailing that hasn't been canceled yet in December, January, maybe even February, whatever, that you can definitely say, okay, let's start packing our bags. Right. We're ready to go because um, there still are a lot of hoops that they need to jump right. through. But again, it's a step in the right direction. Keep monitoring it. Uh, if we hear more news on what's going on, we will let you know. Right. And I would think too that, you know, Disney and other cruise lines have already been preparing a lot of this. They probably, mm -hmm. you know, have been aware of what kind of regulations that they have to demonstrate that they comply with. And so maybe that first part may go quickly because they're that they're ready for. And then it's just how do they actually get everything else in place to get it um you know, actually to right. do the, the testing sales. And I think a lot of this will also depend on uh, ports that they're sailing to and ports that they're sailing out of. Like, right. You know, we know that a lot of the California restrictions are much more in place than, say, Florida, right. for example. So, you know, Florida may be more likely to get some things going early on. California maybe a little later. We'll see how it goes. But again, just good news that they're making the right steps towards possibly this happening and we have two cruises booked now one <laughs> in may and we just booked a brand new one coming Yay! up for december a very merry time sailing so uh, we're really excited about you know, hopefully making both of those right, definitely right. that one in uh, december for sure december of 2021 2021 yeah not, not this year not, not this year no we're not doing the one this year so uh but we've already done one sure. this year that's true <laughs> Boy, did we. 
<laughs> Why did we? So that's it for the Disney stories of the week. Oh, Michelle has a Disney story. I that's all exciting. Michelle always has the best <laughs> Disney stories. So. Well, my Disney story relates to if any of you are ever interested in uh, Rise of the Resistance. I don't know. Maybe some of you might. Yeah, I've help. heard it's okay. Yeah, right. Uh, but they have a new virtual queue process that they're implementing. Um, I can't remember now if it's November 3rd or 4th. I'm Sorry. This week. This week, yeah. Sorry. Um, but, you know, now you, as long as you have a Disney Pass reservation for that park, for Hollywood Studios Park, um, you can try to get into the queue at 7 a.m. You don't have to be in the park to make that oh. uh, attempt to make a reservation. So, whereas right now and up until the, this changeover, you need to be in the park yeah, and you can actually. Uh, gone, scanned in right scanned in and, and either you know at, at 10 in the morning or two in the afternoon make that attempt so now you can um from the comfort of your hotel or home as long as you have that park as reservation long as you're up at 7 a.m yes <laughs> as long as you have that park reservation you can um make your attempt to get in the virtual queue very cool so that's good that's good uh, hopefully this uh, i know that uh, it's it People it's, they have a panic attack trying to get that right. uh, boarding group. So uh, hopefully this will mitigate it a little bit until they can kind of figure it yeah. out better and, you know, have it all planned out as best as possible. Right. So I mean, it's nice that they're trying different options. Yeah. And so. Keep trying until you get it right. Right. Until we can, I mean, no, as we all know, there's <laughs> never going to be a, a, something that makes everybody happy. But right. if we can at least kind of get into that direction as best we possibly can, uh, that would be a good thing. Right. Exactly. So. so. Michelle stories, always the best <laughs> stories. Uh, speaking of the best from Michelle, she gets the best research, <laughs> she has the best lists. And of course, we know that she has the best tips. So let's get right to it. Here is Michelle's tip of the week. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I have s several that I was thinking of, but uh, I'm going to keep mine brief because I've talked a lot already on this <laughs> podcast episode. I'm amazed you saw the voice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, kind of going in line with the Disney Cruise Line. And so what you may not know is you can actually go on the Disney Cruise website and temporarily book without a deposit a reservation on the Disney Cruise. You can go through the whole process of even selecting which cabin uh, and and putting a temporary hold um, and until you, you know, but you have to make a quick decision. I, I think it's usually between 24 and 48 hours in general is what. I'll tell you what, when it, if you right. to, it's until midnight of a certain date. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what, you know, we've had different. Or 11, 59, 59. Right. We've had different dates that it's given. So I'm not sure what generates the duration of that hold, but hey, you know, we don't see that with other cruise lines. It's if you're looking at another cruise line and you're not quite sure you, if you really want to secure a specific cabin, mm -hmm. uh, you have to make that deposit and so this is nice that you know if you're like us or like me that like you're up at late at night and you're just playing around on disney cruise line and you see wow you know i never thought about this but what about this one but i can't make that decision without talking to my sweetheart so let me just put a free hold temporary hold on that and so you can do it yeah i wake up in the morning sometimes and there'll be like three cruise reservations <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're just holds, you know, but it's just kind of funny. Like, okay, now we need to talk about this and decide which one is best, you right. know, and, yeah. or if any of them are good. But uh, we did, like I said, we did book that very merry time cruise just recently. So exactly. that's pretty cool. So, so that's my tip. Very good. Michelle's tip, always Brief. the best <laughs> tip. Uh, my tip is that, uh, and this is something I actually kind of got from uh, our good friends, Rob and Kim LaBerry, who actually are in uh, Walt Disney World Lucky. area as we speak. I know we're so jealous right now, but they were doing a, uh, talking about, uh, they just did a, an episode where they compared the Oogie Boogie Bash mm -hmm. and uh, the Mickey's Not So Scary right, Halloween great Party. Episode. Yeah, it was a great episode. Uh, but yeah, Rob made a good point of making sure that you know that uh, you, you need to know if you're planning on going these things, that you need to know dates when to book them because right. some of these things will sell out True. if you really want to go to them. You don't want to wait too long to get them because, right. I mean, you don't want to be shut out if that's something you've really been looking forward to is going to one of these things. So uh, so I'm going to go through some of the dates that when things are normal, assuming that mm -hmm. things will eventually return and these dates will be as they normally were beforehand, right. um, when do you make these reservations? Now, right now, if you're looking to make a reservation at the Walt Disney World Resort, um, you one, you need to make those park pass reservations as soon as you know the dates mm -hmm. you might want to go and you have tickets or if you have an annual pass or whatever, right. a resort stay. 
uh, go ahead and make those. Those are available. I was looking this morning for a year, you know, mm-hmm. plus. Um, so you can go ahead and start making those now. Uh, but dining reservations can need to be made uh, starting 60 days out. Right. So if there's a special, especially some of these won't be an issue, but there's several of them that you'll want to jump on as immediately when you get the chance to. Now, when things return to normal, uh, there are several um, key dates that you'll need to know if you're going to the Walt Disney World Resort. You know, many of you may know this, but if you don't, um, this is good information for you if you haven't visited the Walt Disney World Resort. Starting with 180 days out, uh, you can make your dining reservations then if you're staying on site. Now that is, if you're staying on site, you can make it for the entire length of your stay. So you can 180 days out, you can make reservations for a week, two weeks, whatever. Right. You can make them all at that point. Uh, if you are off site, if you're staying off site, you can make your dining reservations 180 days out, but they have to be a day at a time. So 180 days from the first day, 180 days from the second right. day, essentially and go on. Uh, you can also do your add-ons at that point. If you're going to the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique, the Pirates League, like things like the right. dessert parties, you know, for some of the nighttime spectaculars when those were turned. Uh, those are important dates to know. At 60 days, uh, this is one fast pass return, assuming the fast pass plus returns. That is when you'll want to start making your fast pass uh, reservations at that point. Uh, if you're staying on site, uh, you can start making them 60 days out, uh, starting at 7 a.m. <laughs> Eastern time, 4 a.m. Pacific time, as we well know here. Um, annual pass holders, uh, you can make those for one week at a time, whether you're staying on site or not. Cool. Um, if you are staying on site, you can make them for your entire vacation uh, during that time. Uh, you can also begin your check-in for your Disney Resort at uh, 60 days out. If you're staying off site, uh, 30 days is your uh, time when you can start making your Fast Pass Plus uh, reservations. Now, uh, that's pretty much the, the key dates for Walt Disney World. At Disneyland, uh, everything is 60 days. Then. Right. Uh, you know, seasonal events, tickets, which are really important because they sell out quickly. Because remember, there's a lot of people in the area, a lot of locals right. who will buy up a lot of those seasonal events or one night specialty events like throwback night, Marvel right. night, Star Wars night, whatever. Um, you'll want to jump on that early. Uh, also, dining reservations are 60 days out. Now, also, Disney Cruise Line has these as well. You need to know the dates for Disney Cruise Lines, and they start on various depending on how many cruises you've done or what your right. level is within the castaway club um castaway club if you remember uh so and these include uh, dining reservations for palo and remy uh tasting seminars wine champagne mixology etc uh, okay. shore excursions spa treatments special character meet and greets uh castaway key cabanas if you're lucky enough to try and, and can afford to get one of those uh you can start doing that if you're either staying at the concierge level or if you're a platinum castaway club member at 120 days out and that starts at midnight eastern time on the u.s uh, uh, if you're a gold castaway club member, you can start booking those 105 days out. Silver castaway club members can book those 90 days before you sail. And if you're a new cruiser, you've never sailed with Disney Cruise Line before, you can start booking those at 75 days out. You will want to jump on those at your earliest possible convenience. Right. You may still not be able to, especially some of the, if you've never sold before or some of the silvers, some of these reservations may already be gone, but you want to try and make it, uh, try and jump on that at the earliest possible chance you have right and if you don't get something it's always um good to check with guest services at on the disney cruise that sometimes people do cancel some things and you might be able to get into something sometimes they save a few things back for people who aren't able to uh, make advanced reservations uh, for some of the uh, other issues so um those are options too yep so yeah definitely check back because a lot of times uh, reservations for palo or remy or tasting right. seminars right. or whatever will open up when you're on board. But uh, try and jump on them as early as possible if you can. Exactly. So that's it for this week. Uh, next week, well, we're quickly approaching Disney Plus's first birthday. Happy wow. birthday, Disney Plus. So we're going to celebrate by looking back at some of our favorite moments in shows and movies and things that have happened from the first year of Disney Plus and then look forward a little bit to what we're excited about in year two. And we'll, of course, be looking for your input on that as well. Yeah, that's going to be exciting and mm-hmm. fun to do. 
should be a lot of fun. So uh, we appreciate that you joined us today. In the future, you can find us most everywhere you get podcasts. However, the very best place to find us is on our own website, HyperionAdventuresPodcast.com. And while you're there... You can sign up for the newsletter. Please sign up for the newsletter. We have lots of information going for you out there on our newsletter. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Twitter at Hyperion Podcast, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Hyperion Adventures Podcast. We do have a YouTube channel. Hopefully you're watching some of these episodes on YouTube to see how lovely Michelle is, to <laughs> see how goofy I am. Hair is still growing. It's full Looking mullet good. stage, full mullet stage Looking now. Uh, you want to find us on YouTube, just do a search for Hyperion Adventures Podcast. Hit subscribe and you'll know whenever we have a brand new video. And if you ever want to contact us for any reason, please hit us up on our Gmail account, Hyperion Adventures Podcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from you. And if you have questions of anything that we've ever pr- uh, put out there or anything else, we really love to help you. Definitely. definitely. If you have any some questions on some of Michelle's research from this one, there's a lot of in-depth stuff, <laughs> uh, please hit us up and uh, I'm sure she'll respond to you at the earliest convenience exactly. for her. So that's it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Hyperion Adventures podcast. We look forward to sharing some time with you again next week. Until that time, I'm Tom. I'm Michelle. And we hope that you have a magical week. Bye.